Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to finish up Part A of Unit 1 Ecology. We're going to complete our discussion of the interactions that happen within and among populations of living things. Now, this means we're going to be focusing here on part number two right here. This is what this PowerPoint or this video cast is going to cover. And let's see, we're also going to cover th three and four, so we're going to do all these. So in this video cast, we're going to cover two, three, and four uh, if we have time. So let's see if we can do it. Okay, populations increase over time or they tend to grow. Remember, as things reproduce, uh, they produce more and more of each other, they're going to grow. And this this pattern of growth can be graphed. So if we put uh, the number of individuals over here on the y-axis and we put time down here in the x-axis, we can produce a graph over time of how a population's numbers or, or growth changes. And in nature, most populations produce a curve that kind of takes an S shape. If you kind of lay an S on its side. So let me show you, show you what I mean here. Uh, the first part of the standard S curve or growth curve for a population is called the lag phase. And this is when the population is really not growing or declining. It may be increasing slightly, but it's not really changing dramatically. Then it enters a phase where its population starts to increase exponentially, which means over each over a certain period of time, the population is doubling. So times are good now. Um, lots and lots of babies or individuals are being produced, and most of them are surviving to reproduce themselves. So the population is really starting to climb uphill quickly. And then finally, populations will reach a plateau phase, okay? A phase where they level out or reach a uh, we're going to use this geography word here, a plateau. And another name for this plateau is the carrying capacity. Now, if you trace this plateau over to our y-axis, you can get a number. So we can say that whatever this population might be, at about year seven, they reach a plateau number of about 95 individuals, and it kind of stays steady at that number. So we're gonna call that the carrying capacity for this population, which means at this particular, with this particular species in this particular place, this is how many individuals can survive given those resources. All right, now some populations don't reach a stable carrying capacity. There always are exceptions in biology. For example, um, here we have two animals, a moose and a wolf. The moose, of course, is a prey species. Uh, wolves hunt in packs and they feed on moose, among other things. And if you look at the population growth curves of these two animals, uh, here we've got uh, wolves, uh, what color? We got moose here in green and we got wolves here in kind of a purple color. And you can see how the populations of both animals go up and down. So, for example, when the moose population is increasing, all right, say around 1965, the moose population is really going up. The wolf population is also increasing. All right, now the moose population reaches a peak in about 1965, and if you notice, it starts to fall. So the moose are coming back down, but the wolf population is still going up. Now, how is that? Well, wolves reproduce more slowly than moose do. Um, so there's a difference in reproductive speed here. So the, the moose population is kind of driving the car here. As there's lots and lots of moose, the, the wolves increase in population because there's a lot of food. And then the moose, maybe they eat all their food or they eat most of their food. Their population crashes, but there's still a lot of wolves around having a lot of puppies for a while. And finally, you get to a point where there's more wolf cubs, where the wolf population will then start to decline again. And these populations kind of bounce around each other. Uh, this is a great example of a cycling population, um, otherwise sometimes known as a boom-bust cycle. All right, Booms are the, are the times when the population is rising rapidly, and busts are crashes. That's when the populations are falling rapidly. So you frequently see this with predator and prey in nature. Uh, sometimes populations can grow out of control. This is particularly common when you take a species from its natural 
location and you move it somewhere where it's never been before. A uh, couple famous examples of this. The first one's a plant. Uh, kudzu is a vine from Asia and it was brought to the United States back in the 1930s. It has no herbivore, no, no caterpillar, no bug eats it here. So once it got going in the United States, it really kind of took over and now it's considered a very bad plant pest. Uh, you may see kudzu growing along the sides of the, the interstate uh, south of Washington, D.C. Um, here's another example of an invasive species. Remember, an invasive species is a species that's been moved from its natural place where it evolved to a, a place where it's never been before. You may have heard of the snakeheads, okay, which is uh, an invasive fish that, again, was brought to the United States from Asia, introduced to our freshwater waterways, and now it's kind of growing and spreading and causing all sorts of trouble. Uh, this fish has the ability to uh, walk for short distances over land, uh, as long as it's wet, like during a rainstorm or something, they can cross over roads from one ditch to another, for example, and spread very easily. A very tough, very aggressive predatory fish called the snakehead. Again, it's it's been introduced by humans into an ecosystem where it did not evolve. It has very few predators, and it's kind of taking over. So sometimes populations can grow out of control. My favorite example of an invasive species are what rabbits did to Australia. Now, you guys may have heard about um, Australia, that big um, island continent um, south of the equator. And here's some pretty interesting pictures. Uh, excuse me, let me go back here. Here's some pictures. Uh, this is a bunch of rabbits around a water hole up here. Um, this is some rabbits. There's a fence here, and they can't get to the other side. Uh, here's a kind of a rabbit stampede. But let's, let's kind of look at what happened here. Um, in the 1850s, when um, Europeans really started to um, set up cities and increase in numbers in Australia, they wanted rabbits to hunt and to eat like they had back in England. So they brought some rabbits to Australia. Australia had no rabbits. And at first, the rabbits, you know, they, they got out. They were running around in the countryside, reproducing, doing what rabbits do. And then their population really started to explode, that exponential growth part of the growth curve. And rabbits kind of became a plague. They became a, um, a, a bane on the um, environment. They were eating everything green, and people actually had to build fences to try to keep them contained. Um, they were competing with sheep and other animals for grass. And so a disease was introduced, and a rabbit disease was brought from Europe, which killed off a lot of the rabbits. Their population crashed, and now they're, they're kind of starting to cause problems again. So rabbits brought to Australia, exponential growth. Farmers introduced a disease to try to control them. Populations crash, and now they're kind of bouncing around. So will rabbits ever reach a, do you guys remember what it was? Will they ever level off? Okay, remember what that's called? Okay, hits right here. What's that number? The carrying capacity. Will rabbits ever reach a stable carrying capacity in Australia? I don't know. But you need to understand what these concepts mean. All right, ecosystems are, remember, composed of the biotic and abiotic components or parts. The biotic parts are the plant communities, the animal communities, and the decomposer communities that all live together. So biotic means living. And these are the plants, the animals, the, um, the bacteria, the fungi, all the things that are causing things to rot and decompose. And then there's the abiotic factors, the soil, the light, the climate, the moisture levels, all of the, the non-living things in the environment that control or limit or, or set up a situation where the living things can live. So ecosystems are made up of communities, which are biotic, and the abiotic parts of the um, environment, so to speak. Okay, biotic and abiotic factors limit population growth. Um, the biotic limiting factors are going to be the factors that have something to do with being alive. For example, food is plants, animals, stuff like that. So a food shortage is a shortage of, of prey species or a shortage of plants, so that's biotic. Uh, diseases. Diseases are organisms. Um, they're also alive, so they might limit a population by killing off individuals. Um, crowding or a shortage of space. Now, space is abiotic, but crowding is caused by lots of individuals. So um, overpopulation is a limiting factor because things, when individuals get crowded together, they tend to have more problems with disease. They tend to run out of food and water and stuff like that. And finally, people. 
uh, people can limit the growth of natural populations. Uh, humans generally tend to like to cut down woods and, and remove forests and make places good for people, but not necessarily good for the animals that have been, have been living there for a very long time. So these are all our biotic factors. Now, abiotic factors are things that are non-living that might limit a population's growth. Uh, water shortages, um, natural disasters like floods and fires, um, all these things are abiotic. Because remember, when a population's growing, it will keep growing until something limits it. And this limiting force pushes down on the growth curve and either makes it level off or maybe makes it crash. But these things that push down on the curve and keep it from going up infinitely are called limiting factors. And they can be biotic or abiotic. Important to know the difference. Now, let's look at an example. Are deer limited in Virginia by biotic and abiotic factors? Of course they are. Um, can you think of some examples of abiotic and biotic factors that limit um, deer populations? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, individuals within a population, for example, these two leopards, uh, oh, I take that back. These are jaguars. These two jaguars are competing with each other. They're the same species, but they're competing. So competition is something that can happen within a population between individuals of the same species or between two different species. And organisms frequently compete over food, water, space, maybe um, um, access to mates. So that's what competition is. To reduce competition, evolution is always limiting or adjusting the niches of species. Now, every species has a niche, and you can think of a niche as the job description of an organism. It's everything it needs to do what it needs to do to stay alive. Uh, it may be what it needs, where it needs to live, uh, what it needs to eat, how much water, what temperature, what climate, uh, what type of seasonal signals it needs to know when to migrate or not migrate. All these things make up the niche of an organism. And organisms fill niches. So each species has its own particular niche. And no two populations, in theory, can live together in exactly the same niche. Because if you think about it, if two different species are trying to to do the same job, they're going to be kind of butting heads with each other. And one population will win, and the other population will most likely go extinct. So let's describe the niche of a deer, of a white-tailed deer. Can you guys think of some things that deer need to live? Of course, this, these, this is a picture of, of suburban deer, very common in um, where our school is, in Alexandria, Arlington. Um, Fairfax County in general. Deer live in our yards. They eat our grass, so they've got food. They like grass. Okay, they like, um, they eat, will eat the leaves of trees. Okay, so that's part of their food. Um, they may eat the things you plant around your trees in your yard, so that's part of their niche. They also are going to need water somewhere. Okay, deer are going to need water. Uh, deer are going to need space. Okay, they need space. Um, deer do very well with um, on the edges of woodlands. If you have a yard with a, a, a little narrow band of trees and bushes, that's all a deer, a deer population really needs to survive. As long as there's food, water, and space, they'll do very, very well. Um, are they limited? Yes, deer get diseases. Deer get overcrowded. They start running out of food. Uh, they start running out of space. Um, if there's not enough space for each male deer to have his own territory, um, that's going to cause um, stress among male deer especially. Um, deer frequently are hit by cars, so cars are kind of like random predators for deer. But all these things make up the niche of deer. So this car right here is part of the niche of a deer, along with um, the light, the soil, all the things that deer do so well with in, in our part of Virginia. Sometimes populations can evolve together in a very close relationship. And these relationships in general are called symbioses. Okay, the word symbiosis just means living together. Now, there are three types or classes of symbiosis. You've probably heard of parasites or parasitism. There's also mutualism and commensalism. We're going to look at an example of each of these so you can be sure to understand the three different types of symbioses. Mutualism is when two species live together and they help each other. So you can think of mutualism as a plus-plus relationship. For example, 
These little ants are living, if you look closely, this is a bamboo-like plant. It's not really bamboo, but it's a tropical rainforest tree. That its stems are hollow. They form these chambers. And the ants chew a little hole in the stem, and they live inside these little apartments, so to speak. And the plant provides a place for them to live. In exchange for this, the ants protect the plant. And so if an animal, for example, if this moth is trying to lay eggs so its caterpillars can eat the leaves, the, the ants will defend the plant against um, this moth, which is an herbivore. Um, here somebody has actually pinned a, a very large ant to the leaf to see what the, how the ants react to it. And they are attaching this, this ant, this invader. So mutualism is when two species help each other and they live very tightly together, helping each other out. So it's a plus-plus relationship. Commensalism is when two species live together and one member of the partnership benefits, the other one really isn't helped or harmed. Um, I like to think of commensalism as one's being helped and the other one really nothing. So, for example, this clownfish lives among the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone, which is this green thing back here, an invertebrate, and the anemone had, isn't helped or harmed by the presence of the clownfish. But the clownfish is definitely helped in this type of symbiosis. So we can call this commensalism. The clownfish lives among the tentacles. It's not stung, but it's protected from predators because no larger fish is going to stick its head in among all these tentacles and get stung. So the clownfish benefits. The anemone really doesn't get benefited, doesn't get any help from this. And finally, our last one is parasitism. And parasitism has a couple words. There is the host and there is the parasite. Okay, and the host is harmed, so that's negative, and the parasite benefits. So parasitism is a plus-minus relationship. For example, this little wasp here is stinging this caterpillar and laying its eggs inside of the caterpillar. And these eggs hatch into little maggots, and the maggots eat the caterpillar from the inside out, and then spin little cocoons attached to the outside when they complete their life cycle. So this parasite, this wasp, is using the caterpillar for food, and this caterpillar, although it's not dead, um, these little larvae know just to eat the fat reserves of the caterpillar and not eat any um, critical organs. So the caterpillar doesn't die outright, but the caterpillar doesn't have enough fat reserve to metamorphosize into a butterfly or a moth, so it effectively does kill its host eventually. Good parasites don't kill their host. Uh, you may know some other example like ticks and fleas and leeches. These are all parasites. Um, they all feed on blood and they, they harm but don't necessarily hurt or, um, or kill or destroy their, their host species. All right, what I want you guys to do in your notebook is to explain um, why each relationship is a kind of symbiosis. Uh, just kind of a quick review of what we just talked about. Um, if you can do this, then I'll be convinced you understand this concept, and we're going to stop there.